Welcome back, dear viewer. The hills of West Virginia are filled with some of the most bizarre folklore and tall tales you'll ever hear. We've talked about all manner of ghosts, witches, and monsters, but this story, even as I'm recording this video, I'm not sure what to classify it as. It started when a viewer left a pretty basic comment on one of my videos. Do you have anything on the Witch of Nicholas County, or was that bogus? This led me to find the story of the woman whose feet never touched the ground, which again, may be one of the most bizarre stories I have come across from the West Virginia Hills. The story was featured on WV Explorer, but I'll share the original WV Ghost page in this video's description. As always, I'll retell the story, then we'll look into the historical and folklore elements that may have inspired parts of this tale. The narrator starts out by saying the story takes place on Ward Road, and nearly every night growing up, they would go and visit their grandmother. While visiting, their mother and aunts and uncle would tell stories and talk about the weird experiences they had growing up beside the woman whose feet never touched the ground. One day, the narrator's uncle decided to take a shortcut on his way home from school through property owned by this woman. He was skeptical of these tales he had heard from his sisters until while passing through her property, he started feeling as though he was being watched. He turned to see the woman whose feet never touched the ground hovering above her yard coming towards him. She was being followed by a hovering table that was spinning and as the narrator put it, almost dancing on one leg. She was very old and her appearance was awful, so awful it was hard to put into words. It looks like somebody's family went to the Lovecraftian school of description and adjectives. In an other encounter, the narrator's mother and younger aunt were crossing the property of the woman coming home from visiting a nearby family member. They were almost to the other side of the woman's property when they heard a sinister laugh that caused them to freeze in their tracks. When they turned, they looked and saw the woman again hovering above the grass, making her way towards the two girls. They quickly ran home and decided to never travel through the property of the woman again. But that wasn't the end of these weird encounters. A few weeks later, while walking down the main road instead of trespassing, the narrator's mother and aunt were getting closer to the property owned by the floating woman. There was an old truck that was parked outside the woman's house, and as they approached, they felt the woman's presence nearby. The mother decided to run over to the truck for whatever reason, and she saw the floating woman laying down in the bed of the truck. Then again, for whatever reason, she decided to yell for her sister to come over and see the woman. Luckily, the sister had already started running home away from the scary supernatural woman who was laying or possibly even sleeping in the bed of the truck, like anyone in their right mind should. Later that night, the mother went back to check to see if the woman was still in the bed of the truck. Again, I have no idea why. As she came close, she saw the woman standing in the bed of the truck, stirring something in a very large cauldron. While those are the only stories we're told, the narrator hints there may have been other encounters between then and when the house burned down in the mid-90s, but after the fire, the woman was never seen again. This is truly a bizarre story. I'm still uncertain if I should classify this as a ghost story, a witch's tale, or some other paranormal encounter entirely. Like always, it isn't my place to judge the authenticity of these stories. I'm here to simply look at the story and the tropes and themes therein. It's my job to try and find what may have inspired these tales and try to find why these themes have continued to resonate 
and be passed down and connect with people throughout history. The story has several classic witch themes like a floating or flying individual and the use of a cauldron. Now before I continue, I just want to say that everything I'm about to talk about take with a grain of salt because a lot of these historical accounts of witches were either presented by people who were observing pagan practices through the lens of Catholicism or confessions given by individuals who were already being tortured for committing witchcraft. These testimonies probably aren't a hundred percent reliable. Likewise, do not try anything I'm going to talk about in this next part at home because we are going to have to delve into the use of hallucinogenics. Probably shouldn't have to specify that, but I'm more than happy to. The first concept of witches flying or floating dates all the way back to the 1300s. These accounts deal with both broom riding and potion making, both of which would become very common tropes when discussing witches. Now, even prior to this, there was a common pagan ritual known as the broom riding ritual, where, especially during the harvest time, individuals would go out and dance around in their fields in the moonlight, sometimes using household objects in this dance. It was supposed to be a fertility ritual because at this point, if you wanted your tribe to do well, you essentially needed two things very successful harvests and lots and lots of children, and it seemed like this fertility ritual kind of covered both of those bases. And then they might have started using hallucinogenics in this ritual as well. Plants like nightshade, hensbane, and mandrake were very common. The most common side effect of consuming these plants or compounds derived from these plants was usually digestive complications like violent vomiting and explosive diarrhea. So in order to avoid these complications that came about through digestion, they attempted to use them in ways that would bypass the stomach. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but these compounds could either be boiled down in large cauldrons into salves where they could be then applied to the skin in parts of the body that would absorb these compounds. The second option, well, let's just say the concept of witches riding brooms probably started out as a metaphor or euphemism. As a quick aside, most of these hallucinogens would cause hallucinations commonly involving rapid movement, weightlessness, and the sensation of flying. Yeah, the idea of flying around uh, was probably something that these individuals felt after using these compounds. Another detail that stuck out to me was the floating dancing table in the first encounter with the uncle. Floating tables were a common seance trick during the spiritualism period of the late 1800s. During seances, mediums would, through contacting the dead, cause their table to rise, mesmerizing those involved with the seance. Unfortunately, a lot of these mediums would use their abilities, would use these illusions to defraud lots and lots of people. Think of psychic mediums at that point as modern day crypto bros. While most were just harmless in it to try and make a quick couple bucks, some were very malicious and were in it to defraud as many people as possible. One of the weirdest bits of illusionist history is the fact that Harry Houdini himself in his early career exposed many of these mediums and how they went about doing their seance illusions. Houdini was so aggressive at exposing mediums that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, begged Houdini not to go after mediums or mystics in fear that eventually he would expose all the fraudulent ones 
and be going toe-to-toe with an actual medium who would be capable of directly cursing him or summoning spirits to attack him. Again, the tale of the woman whose feet never touched the ground is a fascinating one, and I feel like there are probably other accounts of this woman that we do not have stories of. Had you ever heard the tale of the woman whose feet never touched the ground? And what other West Virginia ghost stories would you like for me to talk about in the future? Let me know in the comments, and I hope to speak to you again very, very soon.